Welcome to Silver City Baptist Church, Sunday night, September the 27th, and we are coming to the end of our Bible study. This is lesson number 19 of our prophecy series for 2020, and we've looked at great detail of, of the entire history of the, of the prophecies concerning the end times. We began with the rapture, and uh, now we're to that, tonight we are on... Uh, the New Jerusalem, chapter 21, beginning of verse 9 in our text. And we'll go through chapter 22, verse 5, as we look at our study tonight. Let's have a word of prayer and ask God to bless us as we get into the word tonight. Father, we thank you for the opportunity we have to study your word. We thank you, Lord, that you've revealed to us so many great details about what's going to happen in the future. And Lord, we know as we watch the world in which we live, as it continues to just work, work, work its way towards the very description that you're giving in the Word of God thousands of years ago. We pray that we'll be motivated and uh, by what we know to be able to warn others of what they need to know to know Christ as their Savior. We just pray you'll bless now our Bible study of the New Jerusalem. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, in Torah chapter 21, after what we saw last week, and last, last week we saw the old world destroyed the, the old heavens destroyed, the old heaven, world destroyed, and a new heavens and a new earth was created. And uh, <clears throat> no sin or corruption will ever enter into the new heaven and the new earth. Now we're going to see that again in our study tonight. That, that statement is mentioned several times in the closing chapters of uh, Revelation chapter, uh, the closing chapters of the book of Revelation, reminding us that what, ha what has happened in the world now, what we're living in now, is over. And there's a new heaven and a new earth. And now we read in chapter 21, verse 9, and we'll read verses 9 through 11 to begin. And there came unto me one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials full of the, last, the seven last plagues, and talked to me, saying, Come hither, I will show ye the bride, the lamb's wife. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me that a great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God. And her light was like unto the stone, most precious, even like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. And so what we see here in these first few verses is the appearance, the appearance of the new Jerusalem. One of the angels, which actually was one of the angels who actually poured out the final judgments upon the world during the tribulation time. He's the one that he sees again. And this time he says, I want to show you the bride, the lamb's wife. Then he shows John the new Jerusalem. And the Bible says it's descending out of heaven. It's, why is it called the bride and the lamb's wife? And I want to point out to you that the reason is because of who is going to dwell in the new Jerusalem. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 2, For I am jealous over you with a godly jealousy, for I have espoused you unto one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. What that verse is talking about is Paul, and he's equating the preaching of the gospel and seeing the Corinthians saved with them being a part of the bride of Christ. What that tells us is that the church, those that are saved during the church age from the time of Christ's resurrection until the time of the rapture are a part of the church and that they are a part of the bride of Christ. We go on to another verse to look at in chapter 19, verses 7 and 8, where it talked about the description of the ones coming with the Lord. It says, let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him for the marriage of the Lamb is come. And his wife hath made her stuff ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. So here John's talking about the marriage of the lamb. <clears throat> and he's talking about the fine linen, the clean and white, which represents the righteousness of the saints. Why is this appearance of the city, why is the angel calling it the bride, the lamb's wife, is because of who in particular is going to uh, dwell in the new Jerusalem. That brings us to another slide here. 
The appearance continues. <clears throat> it says that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. <clears throat> Here a city is descending down from heaven, <clears throat> appears to hover the earth. It is the new Jerusalem, it says. It is, says in verse 2 of chapter 21 that when it appears, it's prepared as one prepared. It reminds me again, reminds us again of the promise that Jesus gave to his disciples in John 14. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. This place coming down out of heaven is the place that God has been preparing for the dwelling of his saints. Um, and that's why we call it the New Jerusalem. Prepared. Then it says, having the glory of God. Now, usually when the glory of God is described in the Bible, it includes a cloud that of God, visualizing the presence of God in the tabernacle and in the temple. And it was, a, it was always a situation, as Exodus 40 tells us, where once the, once the glory of God shone around about, those human beings around it could not approach it. Uh, Exodus 40, verses 34, 35. <clears throat> then a cloud covered the tent of the tabernacle of the congregation, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle, and Moses was not able to enter into the tent of the congregation, because the cloud abode thereon, and the glory of God, the Lord, filled the tabernacle. The glory of God and God's presence is in the New Jerusalem, and yet, and yet, we will be able to uh, abide with the Lord. That's the difference between a man who's saved, as like Moses, saved, but still a sinner, still a sinner uh, in, in his natural state. He is not able to approach the glory of God. But the glorified saints of all generations now, in, in the book of Revelation says, we can be in God's presence and in his glory and, and still uh, approach him and worship him and dwell with him. What a beautiful, beautiful uh, idea. And the redeemed of the ages dwelling in the glory of God. We, we can't even imagine what that's going to be like uh, to be able to dwell in a presence of God that no earthly being was able, able to ever truly dwell in. And yet, that's what we're going to be like in the, uh, the New Jerusalem. And then it says that it's going to be clear as crystal. It appears that the brightness of this city will make it look like glass. It will shine and sparkle like a precious stone. What a beautiful sight. Uh, the overall appearance of the New Jerusalem is an amazing, amazing sight. Uh, if you go on the Internet and Google, uh, you know, pictures of the New Jerusalem, you'll see some. Ideas. And I think there's some good artist uh, depictions. I don't know what you're allowed to use. There's always that warning under there. Some things are copyrighted, and so to, to play it safe, I didn't put a picture up here. But many of them, you will see, always show that glory, that brightness, that, that the clear as crystal described here in Revelation uh, chapter uh, 21. Now, let me tell you something. This warning is when you go, ever go on the Internet. <laughs> Look and compare it to Scripture, because we're going to talk some more things about the, the, the city. It's not your typical city, and uh, I'm not sure that any picture could actually capture it, but some of them don't even come close, because they just, just draw a beautiful city that's outstanding looking, but they don't follow the scriptural details, and yet I've seen some that do. Um, it says in uh, the next slide, I want to show you the, the wall of that New Jerusalem. The wall. Let's look at the description. Now, if you look at verse 17 of chapter 21, it says, And he measured the wall thereof 144 cubits. Now, pretty, pretty standard belief that a cubit in the Bible days of, re, of, of uh, measurement was about 18 inches in our day to day. It'd be like a, a, a foot and a half. And that was what they called a cubit. And um, so that means that the walls of this city are 217 feet high. The height of the walls. 
And let's, let's read the verses again, because I want to get the whole picture here, uh, the other verses that we're going to refer to. And uh, had a wall great and high, and had 12 gates, and had the gates 12 angels, and the names written thereon, which are the names of the 12 tribes of the children of Israel. On the east, three gates. On the north, three gates. On the south, three gates. On the west, three gates. And the wall of the city had uh, 12 foundations, and in them the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. So we see this further description here. The city is uh, 217 feet high. The walls, the walls have 12, gate, 12 gates, three on each side. <clears throat> and the wall, uh, each, each one of those tribe, each one of those gates is guarded by an angel. And also on the name of each one of those gates is one of the 12 tribes of Israel. And then it goes to the 12 foundations, and it says that the 12 foundations have in their in the name on them the 12 apostles. What you see in this new Jerusalem is not just the church, but really I pictured all the redeemed of all the ages. Israel and, uh, and, and uh, the church alike are pictured here, because this is the dwelling place of the saints, okay? the saints of all the generations as well. So we see this description, the wall of Jerusalem. Then we see the measurements of the new Jerusalem, verses 15 through 17. And, he, and he, he that talked to me had a golden reed to measure the city and the gates thereof and the wall thereof and the city lieth four square and the length is as large as the breadth and they measured the city with a reed 12,000 furlongs. The length, the breadth, and the height are all equal. And then I already read verse 17 where he measured the walls and described the height of the wall. Now, what we want to see there is but says that this, this, this four square. And what that means is that the, the, this measurement he's going to take is the same in all directions. Now, I, I see some commentators and they go into great discussion as to why that is and how it's a perfect plan of God. And that, that's, I'm sure it's a plan of God because it's, it's the city that the Lord is making and creating. But at the same time, the unusualness of that, and I mentioned this uh, this morning when I talked about uh, tonight's message, <clears throat> When it, 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 it is either a cube shape or a pyramid shape. And, and those pictures I mentioned on the internet, very few try to capture that. But you will see some that do capture a cube shape or a pyramid shape. And the idea of the pyramid, of the measurements, since the height is the same distance as the length and the width uh, and so forth, that makes it uh, it could be a cube, it could be a pyramid. I kind of like the idea of the pyramid better because then it would picture that the ascension to the very top of the pyramid would probably be the location of God's throne. And that would make a lot of sense. But it could be either. Not, this is one of those things I always like to say, not worth a lot of time of investment of trying to prove your point because you can't prove it. So I just put that out there. Uh, I like that pyramid shape. Uh, best, but you can have whatever you want. One thing for sure, it is a large, large city, 1,500 miles in length, width, and height. So it's going to be an amazing sight as it appears to hover between the earth and uh, between the uh, earth and heaven. Now, the materials of the New Jerusalem, verses 18 through 21, and the building of the wall of it was of jasper. And the city was pure gold, like a clear glass. And the foundations of the wall of the city were garnished with all manner of precious stones. The first foundation was jasper, the second sapphire, the third chalcedony, and the fourth was emerald, the fifth sardox, and the sixth sardius, and the seventh chrysolite, and the eighth beryl, and the ninth topaz, and the tenth Christ Christophos, uh, and the eleventh adjacent, and the twelfth amethyst. Listen. A description of great, beautiful gems of all types. And the 12 gates were 12 pearls. Each, every several gate was of one pearl. And the street of the city was pure gold, as it were, transparent glass. The, the, the materials used in the city, the, the city are amazing. It, says, it talks about jasper several times. I, wanted, I looked that up on the internet. 
And a jasper is an opaque variety of quartz and is usually associated with brown, yellow, reddish colors, but may also be used to describe other colors like of quartz such as dark or mottled green, <clears throat> um, mot mottled green, orange, and black. Jasper is almost always multicolored and unique color patterns and, ha and habits and has always used to have glitter, a glittering sparkle to it as well when it's broken and, and cut and so forth. <clears throat> It is a multicolored, beautiful city. The foundations of the city <clears throat> are beautiful. And it's certainly like nothing we've ever seen or can even imagine. The foundations of the walls will be made of all types of gems and precious stones. What unsurpassed beauty. What an unbelievable description. I do want to say this. It not only describes beauty, uh, it's also a description of strength, of strength. And then the 12 gates. The 12 gates are of, a, each one is a giant pearl. 12 giant pearls, big enough to be a, ga a, a gate for people to walk through. It's just an astounding picture. And, um, and then finally it says that the streets are with pure gold so that they appear like transparent glass. What an amazing amazing picture. You see, the New Jerusalem is a picture that we often describe and talk about when we talk about heaven. And uh, it's the, the, the new city that God creates and brings down a hover upon the new earth, above the new earth. Now, the next one, I want to bring to the temple of the New Jerusalem, verse 22. Verse 22, and I saw no temple therein. For the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. Listen, there is no temple. What was the purpose of the temple? The purpose of the temple on earth was necessary to have access to God. It was where sacrifices were made to make it possible for a man to approach God because of man's sin and man's wickedness. Sin separated us from fellowship with God. The temple on the old uh, earth had a necessary purpose. But in the new Jerusalem, there is no purpose. There is no more sin. Sin has been done away with. Sin has been cast aside. The old world has been burned up. And now the new world will never, as we say again, never have the effects of sin allowed in it. The effects of sin is gone. Therefore, because the effects of sin is gone, there's no need for a temple. And at the same time, he says, the temple is God and Jesus Christ. The Lamb of God and God are the temple of it. Why? Because they have been, they, their plan, the plan of God for salvation, created from the beginning of the world, carried out by God's Son, and brought to completion by God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, they have made it possible for a man to now dwell, glorified man, to now dwell in heaven with God with no more need of a barrier, no more need of a temple to, to make it possible. Now, in our glorified state, it is possible for us to worship and to live and to abide with the Lord. They are the temple they're in. They are fulfilling the purpose of the original temple in the old world. Then to go to the next, the next slide, and we see the light of the New Jerusalem. The light of the New Jerusalem. We're going to read verses 23 through 27. And the city had no need of sun, neither of moon, nor to shine in it, for the glory of God did lighten it. And the Lamb is the light thereof, and the nations of them which are saved shall walk in the light of it. And the kings of the earth do bring their glory and honor unto it. And the gates of it shall not be shut all by day, for there shall be no night there. <clears throat> and they shall bring the glory and the honor of the nations into it. And there shall be in no wise enter into it anything that defileth, neither whatsoever worketh abomination or maketh a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. And the new Jerusalem has no need of the moon or the sun. It has no need of light. The Lord, the Lamb, is the light of the city. The glory of God will lighten the city. The nations of the same will come to dwell in the new Jerusalem uh, 
and, and all the saints, and then also uh, be a center of worship. The people of the earth, probably referring to the millennial saints, who will probably be the ones who will inhabit, inhabit the new earth, the new world. <clears throat> they will come to worship the Lord at the new Jerusalem. These are all things of, you put together by putting all the scriptures and comparing them. They aren't stated in any one place. Once again, these are my thoughts. Maybe you see things a little differently there. But unlike the first heavens and the first earth, this one will always and forever <clears throat> be protected. Sin will not enter in it. Now, all the saved of all time, it says in verse 27, uh, are those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. The only ones who have eternal life and get to enjoy eternal life are those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. We know that from several verses in the scripture, and especially concerning the, the great white throne judgment, that final judgment, uh, when all those who are in hell are brought back to judgment and cast in the lake of fire. And it says the only ones that go to heaven are they written in the Lamb's Book of Life, and none of those are. No, none stand at that judgment are. Only those who are saved from the beginning of time, from, the, from Adam up through the end of time when the, when the uh, millennial kingdom ends, all those who are saved, they get to walk in the light of the new Jerusalem because they have been redeemed. They are, their name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. That brings us to another Part. The next thing is the life of the New Jerusalem. 22, chapter 22, verses 1 and, 1 and 2. And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. And in the midst of the street of it, uh, and on either side of the river, was there a great the tree of life, which bare twelve manner of fruits, and yielded her fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were uh, for the healing of the nations. The description there is that this city, the, the life of it, uh, the beauty of it, the, the river of life, the river of life. Uh, Jesus spoke, spoke to the woman at the well uh, about him giving water of life that eternal, that is, sustains eternally rather than the water, uh, temporary water of the well. And the tree of life, of course, the one uh, provide eternal life forever and ever in the Garden of Eden, which was, uh, that's why Adam and Eve were excluded from the Garden. Once they had disobeyed and taken the fruit of the trial of knowledge of good and evil, they were forbidden to be in the Garden. They could not be near the tree. Here we have it. Humongous tree. It describes a tree that covers both sides of the river and, and so forth. Uh, this is the picture of the life in the New Jerusalem. And then the God of the New Jerusalem, found in verses 3, 4, and 5. <clears throat> and there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. And they shall see his face, and his name shall be in their foreheads. And there shall be no night there, there shall be no candle, neither light of the sun. For the Lord God himself giveth light, and they shall reign forever and ever. The eternal throne of God is now seen, pictured here. The eternal throne of God. Uh, you know, the, the Bible said that when Jesus started reigning, of his kingdom there would be no end. And we emphasize back when we studied the millennial kingdom that the thousand years does not, was not a kingdom that was, was begun and started. It was a kingdom that was begun and continued. But at the end of the thousand years is when the Lord judges. He allows Satan to be loosed and Satan gathers a rebellion and he judges those who rejected him at that time. And then, of course, he creates a new heavens and a new earth. He casts all those uh, rebellious people and unbelievers and all those who reject him into the lake of fire. And it, but his kingdom didn't stop. It continued. But now it's referred to as an eternal kingdom no more changes. Nothing happens differently. It goes on and on forever with the Lord and God and Jesus Christ ruling forever and ever. Now, we have seen a lot of descriptions tonight of the heavens, of the new Jerusalem, of what eternity is going to be like 
uh, worshiping and dwelling with the Lord in the New Jerusalem. I know it's something I didn't touch on there, that it says that, that the servants of the Lord serve him. We don't have a clue. We don't have a detailed clue of what all is going to be involved in heaven and eternity, except it's going to be the most glorious existence possible. Everything that we need, we're going to have. Everything we want, we're going to have. It's going to be a tremendous time of worship and having all that sin and evil gone and gone forever. But that's no wonder that uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2 says, But as it is written, I hath not seen nor ear heard, neither hath entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit, for the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. <clears throat> it says on the one hand, <clears throat> that we don't understand all that we have. On the other hand, it says God reveals it to us. What we're seeing, and if you looked at this closing scriptures here, is yes, even when God describes what it's going to be like, we can't fully comprehend it. He's given us enough to know all that we need to know. If there's more that we needed to know, God would have revealed it. He didn't because he gave us all that we need to know. But at the same time, we will never truly be able to understand what it's going to be like in heaven and eternity and with the Lord and the new heavens and the new earth until we actually get there. Now, I'm reminded, though, one more thing I want to bring out. Uh, to dwell for all eternity with God and his saints at, uh, of all generations will be an awesome thing. But as I was thinking about that, I reminded of, of uh, Psalm 133, 133, verse 1, where it says, Behold how good, how pleasant it is, for the brethren to dwell together in unity. It is like the precious ointment upon the head that ran down the beard, even Aaron's beard, and went down to the skirts of his garments as the dew of Hermon, and as the dew that, des that descendeth upon the mounts of Zion. For there the Lord commanded the blessing, even life forevermore. You know, we think about that verse, and we quote that verse, and we talk about experiencing the blessings of Christian unity, the experience, the blessings of fellowship we have with believers. And I've heard many, many Christians say, you know, my Christian family is closer to me. We have a greater fellowship than I have with my unsaved family because we have these commonalities. We have the same Lord and Savior, the same Holy Spirit, the same Word of God. We're, we all have the same desires, and it makes a wonderful time of fellowship. We quote uh, Psalm 133 because it talks about, you know what? It is a wonderful thing when believers dwell together in unity and work together for the glory of God. But then that last phrase, when he says, uh, for, the, for there the Lord commanded the blessing, even life forevermore. You see, even here on earth, unfortunately, our, our wonderful unity of the brethren is sometimes disturbed. Why? Because of sin. Yes, but sin by believers, sin of, of jealousy, sin of uh, pride. Those are the two that most often disturb the unity of the church. And it's sad to say that that's a reality of this world that we live in right now. If we allow Satan to you know, tempt us and, and we can destroy the unity of the believers, but in eternity, that is all gone. So as much as we say, well, it's going to be wonderful, we are going to fellowship and live and dwell with God for all of eternity. And that is the greatest thing of all the Bible talks about. In the closing verses we just read, it reminds us that is also going to be the blessing of dwelling together in the, the community of the saved. All believers from all ages enjoying fellowship like never before. Why? Because the old sin nature is gone, the old sin of pride and jealousy and all those things. That's gone, never going to enter. We can have perfect unity and fellowship for all of eternity. And that's what the Bible describes. What a day, as the songwriter put, what a day that will be when we see Jesus. And so tonight we come to the end of our Bible study. We have one more Bible study next week to close out our series. We will, we will do a little review of the chart. We'll, we'll sum things up. We have one more Bible study to talk about eternity and how it should affect us now. How the knowledge of what God gave to John in the book of Revelation was given for the purpose of not just knowing the facts, not being able to quote the details, but rather to have a life that we live based on what we know. And so we thank you for being with us tonight. 
in this great time of Bible study. Let's have a closing word of prayer. Father, we thank you for your blessings to us. Lord, we thank you for the, the knowledge that one day we're going to be in the new Jerusalem with all the believers and on the earth and the new heavens and the new earth, fellowshipping with God and fellowshipping with one another in a great, wonderful time of unity and love and, and worship of the Lord and all common th things we have together. And Lord, we just pray you'll bless us and help us, Lord, to realize that we should want others to also be a part of what God has promised for eternity. What a great, great promise that we've seen of this description of the new Jerusalem. We just pray you'll help us now to live a life that is honoring and glorifying to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I invite you to our study on Wednesday night, 7 o'clock. We're studying the book of Jude. And uh, this week, if we get into our study on the book of Jude, we'll be reminded again uh, that God, what is God's view of rebellion? Jude is going to talk about rebellion and those who have been rebellious down through the centuries and what God thinks about that. Great topic for us today. As I told you before, the little book of Jude has a big message for us today as it has all time, but especially for us today. So the next, this Wednesday night, 7 o'clock, we'll be meeting uh, by live stream only. We'll be talking about Jude and the sin of rebellion. Thank you again for joining us and I'll see you on Wednesday night at 7 o'clock.